will do so as the session goes on. So given we nearly ran out of time yesterday, we should probably get started. Uh, so you'll bear with me as I share my screen. System permissions. One second. <laughs> Dear. Um, I will have to rejoin you. So if you can just wait, sorry about this. Hey, everybody, I'm back. Thank you for waiting. Uh, so I'll share my welcome slides. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, um, this is not new for you. Are you able to see those? Yes. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, so, um, this is a 3 day workshop by the Internet architecture board. Yes. I'm I didn't hear that. Sorry. Uh, so yesterday we had a session uh, on community networks. Uh, that was moderated by Drew. Today, I'm moderating the session on digital divide. Um, we'll run for two hours, and then tomorrow will be a session on censorship. Um, so you can see the overall uh, view of all the accepted papers and all the presentations. They're already uploaded, um, and you can also go back to the notes after the sessions are finished. So um, we are really uh, we've already collected reports. Um, these reports and the presentations you'll be uh, hearing this week are about um, barriers to access, both content and services. Um, we are looking at issues that related that are related to censorship with the filtering and blocking, um, as well as other barriers that might um, indicate um, inequality or other kinds of technological incapabilities. Um, so we're trying to understand what the contours are of these problems and then specifically, and this is where the discussion is going to be focused, um, how the IETF can actually work on this. And I will, and especially for today, because um, you know, yesterday we talked about community networks. We have obvious ongoing work in that area from Gaia. Um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about censorship. We have obvious work in that area in various working groups and research groups. But the digital divide, which is the topic of our session today, is less clear aware those discussions are happening, right, um, if at all. Um, and so we're going to have to get really creative and uh, have a lot of deep discussion about how we actually manifest some of this work um, in the IETF, which is really the purpose of hosting this workshop at all. Um, so you'll see some of these sub questions here, um, and hopefully we'll get to that after we listen to our speakers today. Uh, so we have a mailing list, you should all be on it. Um, you should have all seen the, both the papers and the slides that are available on the data tracker for this workshop page. Um, you can also access um, 
our ongoing report, I guess at some point um, in the GitHub. <laughs> we are recording this workshop. Um, the point is to, um, you know, obviously record what is discussed. So we're going to be, so that, so that's one. Um, if you want to be on the queue, uh, you need to add yourself in the WebEx chat for that. Um, plus Q and minus Q if you want to leave the, the Q uh, for any reason. And then also know that the, that chat is also going to be recorded and downloaded as well as the participant list. So it isn't just the video and the audio. Um, last thing is that um, I want to be clear about our Q&A cadence. So we're going to have three presentations. Those are each going to be followed by a very brief moment where we ask clarifying questions. You know, can you go back to slide X? Um, I didn't understand what you meant when you said why, you know, that sort of thing. But really the sort of deeper interventions, the philosophical questions um, need to be held for the end. And I will um, hold myself responsible for not obeying that yesterday very well, um, but we're going to make sure we do it today. Uh, so today, um, again, we have three speakers. We're going to start off with Ralph, Hol Ralph Holes, who's talking about um, evidence and specifically around DNS measurement. Um, then we'll talk um, with Sarmad Hussein, who's going to be talking um, about universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses, um, and specifically focused on a framing of digital inclusion, which I very much um, align with. And then lastly, we'll be looking at sort of the affordability and the inclusiveness of the web with uh, Rumeisa Habib. So we're really happy to have all of you here with us today already. Um, and so I will stop sharing this set of slides. Um, and if Ralph, you would like to share your slides, you can do that. If not, I'm also able to share them for you and you can just tell me to progress, whichever you prefer. And you're on mute, so I'm, oh, okay, I see you're pulling them up, that's brilliant, great. Thank you, so if you can see my slides, that would be great. We and can see the them, yeah. okay. And the audio is fine. Okay. Audio is great. Uh, well, I'm ready if I can go. Um, yes, please yeah, do. Thank Thanks. you for that. Yeah, thank you for having me today. So I, I would like to briefly talk a little bit about uh, an expression of the digital divide, uh, the example of Australia. It's a kind of roundabout project how we came to talk about this. But basically, um, at some point, we were wondering during the COVID pandemic, well, what happens to all these health sites that are, have to be accessed by citizens of Australia? And we already knew, obviously, that the further out you get in Australia, the more you get to the outback, the worse your internet access is. But we started to wonder, what about the server side? Is there maybe a disadvantage for indigenous populations in terms of not being able to access all government websites equally? Or in other words, does the general population have access to better, faster, and more convenient services, maybe? And uh, one way we started to think about this was to think about, um, okay, maybe how are they hosted? Can we have a look at how uh, websites, government websites for the indigenous populations are hosted? And uh, obviously, you know that the digital divide is a term that commonly is uh, considered in the context of being able to have access to the internet or have to have digital competences, being able to access services. However, what about the, uh, uh, the, the aspect of delivery? Like every service must have some kind of provisioning in the domain name system and there must be dependencies. And do these dependencies maybe interfere with the availability of a service or can they interfere? That's all part of an agenda that we have nicknamed Internet Transparency for now. And uh, yeah, it's a, it was basically a pet project that uh, we started during the COVID pandemic. We decided, let's have a look at all these DNS dependencies of services uh, in Australia and see if we find a difference between those for the indigenous populations and those for the general populations. And uh, the first step, basically, that we took here was to, well, do desk research, which was not so easy. It was a, um, a, long, a long road, actually, using Google and uh, manually uh, creating lists of domain names that uh, had a certain purpose, we classified them, and then we tried to identify are they only for the indigenous population or are they more general? So these are the two main categories we have. 
The technical aspects were fairly easy. Uh, we simply retrieved the authoritative name servers of the domains because we wanted to know uh, what delegations do they have and can we maybe identify the hosting situation so we could also analyze the DNS dependencies and have a look which providers are responsible. And uh, our results, I'll get to that uh, very fast here, was uh, basically we could see differences in four aspects. Would they use hyperscalers, uh, the big sites like Microsoft Azure or Amazon uh, AWS DNS services, Cloudflare, etc.? Or would they more rely on uh, the domestic providers that exist in Australia? Or, interestingly, we found that some sites um, are supported by what we call, with more or less justification, government-owned providers. For example, we found that the Queensland University of Technology provides a DNS service to some government uh, websites, which was a little bit unexpected, because uh, if you know a little bit about the educational system of, uh, of Australia, then the universities are a little bit separate from the government, but at the same time, they still belong to the well, to the public services. So we group them as uh, government-owned providers with more or less justification. And uh, one thing we already knew about from previous publications by colleagues uh, was, is a site going to use more than one DNS provider or uh, not? So a single DNS provider is always problematic because it can uh, simply fail and then your website is not available. If you have multiple of them, especially if they're on different continents or have uh, di very different setups, that could be a real advantage for availability. And these are the differences we found. So to, to cut to the chase, um, we find some evidence that indigenous populations have access to services that have a different provisioning strategy. It is not super pronounced um, and just enough, I would say, to encourage us to continue with our work. Um, among the things we found, for example, is that there are certain leading providers. These are the big five, six, seven names that everyone knows. And uh, we found that they are more prominent for uh, the general population. In, in other terms, um, a site that the Australian federal government, uh, for example, provides is more likely to use one of those, whereas services for indigenous, uh, for the indigenous populations, um, they tend to use fewer of these uh, providers and sometimes those that we call non-leading, by which we group the international small or domestic small providers. And, uh, they also, the, the two populations share a few aspects. For example, the, the huge providers are always used by uh, about 50% in uh, both cases. Um, again, with the caveat that we find uh, a longer tail in the case of the indigenous uh, populations. Not quite unexpectedly, um, the multi-provider strategy is really rare, but there is a difference. We found that uh, in the, for the general populations, you're more likely to have uh, more than one DNS provider. Whereas for the indigenous populations, we never found a single case where there was a setup that used more than one DNS provider. We also saw, and that supports our previous case, we saw that uh, domestic providers are more likely found for indigenous websites, and they're also smaller. Um, the support that I earlier mentioned that comes from government websites, like a university, etc., we only ever found that for the uh, general uh, population domains, where actually more than a quarter had such a setup, but never in the case for domains for the indigenous populations. On the whole, we also saw a little bit less diversity um, in the two uh, populations, but that was not the strongest aspect. So with that result, I, I, really need to I really need to stress, this was a very early PhD work, a kind of topic that we chose because we could. And uh, it was more of a pilot to figure out, is this actually worth going after? And the answer to that, to us, at least seems to be yes, because there are a few implications that we believe are going to hold. It's clear there is less redundancy in some cases, um, meaning that there is a higher chance of failure that may affect one population more than the other. We also think that this uh, may have to do with the level of competence in the administrations or the willingness maybe uh, of an administration or even the affordability for an administration um, to uh, pay for, uh, for larger providers. So the difference there seems to indicate it's worthwhile going after this. We also were kind of curious 
if anything at all, we would have expected that government uh, sites or government providers like university would be more likely to support smaller websites. So we're kind of surprised that they're more likely to support a larger website. So that's also a bit of a difference between these two and the, uh, what I mentioned, this reliance on the domestic providers. It may all have to do with fewer resources. And by resources, I don't just mean finances and funding. I mean also personnel and staff that is capable of dealing with multi-provider setups, for example. That may all be at play here. However, we obviously don't have a very consistent proof. We have hints, first evidence, that it's worthwhile to go after this. And the limitations of our study are clear. For example, we only ever did a first uh, analysis of direct dependencies, direct delegations. But we also saw a few really interesting and curious chains where you have a service that is provisioned by, let's say, a big provider for, for the sake of a better name. Now, let's just choose Microsoft. Let's say Microsoft is there. And then there is a further delegation uh, towards the root that is actually a much smaller provider. And we found a couple of these curious cases and decided, okay, it's probably uh, worthwhile to have a look at this. Also, we did this as a one-off during the uh, pandemic. What we should have done, of course, was to uh, track this over time and we've done a little bit of work on this now, we're collecting data. Um, whenever you look at small populations, especially the indigenous population of Australia, which is much smaller than the total population, that means you have to deal with small sample sizes. So you have to take our, especially our percentage values, you have to take them with a, a grain of salt here, please. And uh, the same goes for the fact that this is an Australian focus. So when I presented this work at a uh, workshop recently, on what we call the responsible internet. Um, there was some buy-in from people uh, from other places in the world. For example, uh, one researcher from Indonesia said they would love to replicate this, uh, this kind of study also uh, for a country like Indonesia that has 200 million people, uh, I think, and uh, also has quite a few vulnerable populations. So that's how the term vulnerable populations uh, as opposed to indigenous population came in. The two overlap, obviously, but are not quite the same. And uh, we also didn't go after other forms of outsourcing, right? So we could, of course, have analyzed the who is data and uh, figure out does an IP address actually belong to that um, to that provider, or has it been leased, or is there some other form of outsourcing going on? So on the whole, we think what we arrive at is we do find evidence for a digital divide. There is an expression of that. That's not entirely surprising. If anything at all, it was not very strong, just strong enough to tell me it's worthwhile to look at it. I really believe that uh, there should be a bit of an agenda here that we uh, look at how services for different population groups are provisioned and uh, that could be uh, also a help for governments because they are obviously very large and I'm, I don't mean to imply that they do this in any way intentionally, more that it's uh, simply more likely depending on the funding that you have that you might forget about a certain issue. And uh, we do believe that the different DNS apps, setups may matter. If you think about uh, the outage that Australia experienced uh, just a month or so ago, due to a little bit of a redirection in the BGP tables when the uh, owner of the uh, Australian Optus provider uh, made a mistake, how many people were affected then. So we do believe that these single points of failure and this high level of centralization that we're experiencing that may on occasion lead to a certain vulnerability that may hit vulnerable populations particularly hard. So our conclusion that we would like to offer, and that's why I submitted this talk to this workshop is, I would like to see how much buy-in is there to use internet measurement methods to analyze the setup of services for vulnerable populations and do we see differences and can we bring these differences to the attention of uh, the relevant parts of uh, the world's governments. And that's already my talk, so uh, thank you very much for that and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Um, so for folks who um, have some clarifying questions, please feel free to add yourself to the queue. Um, it looks like um, Miria, you're first. Um, yeah, thank you for this presentation. And I think it's it's uh, really interesting to have these kind of measurement studies. Um, if I understand you correctly, I think the, the point you're making is that like this different kind of management configuration can lead to less reliability, right? 
but I guess that's a little bit how the internet works, right? It really depends on like how you decide to operate something, <laughs> how much re re reliability you get. So I wonder if it's more a question about um, expertise in, in setting up the services and training of people. Could be. So sorry, I'm answering immediately. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. I actually didn't ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, absolutely. Uh, I think what we need to bring together here, more, more from the academic side, but also from the IDF side, obviously, is uh, we should also have qualitative studies. We should actually talk to the governments and figure out, hey, what happened there? Do you actually know that the Queensland University of Technology, I think it was that university, don't, don't nail me to the wall if I got it wrong, but uh, do you actually know that they support your service or is this just some kind of artifact of some previous uh, setup? Is this intentional? If it is intentional, what did you hope to achieve with it? Did it work? And why do you do it for these services but not for others? So I think this is an opportunity also to bring, to, to obtain a deeper understanding of how we actually operate the internet, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very interesting to look in this and, and asking these questions. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Arno, you're next. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you for uh, this very interesting presentation. Um, I think I would like to continue on Miria, in fact, on the intentional aspect. I mean, my, my really naive question is, is it that we end up in this situation because there is an intention to deserve the Indian, uh, indigenous people in Australia, or is it is it a more naive problem that basically, I don't know, they are not paying enough, so they get what, what they get for the money, or how, how would you, because I, I could see the point on the government is not supporting them. Are you suggesting this is intentional, or are you suggesting that it's just like, like a neglect, or or uh, um, it's just for my clarification to understand what you're asking. Definitely to. not intentional. I do not believe that it's the intention of the Australian government, quite on the contrary. I think it is simply uh, possibly an artifact of the fact that responsibilities are distributed over many, many shoulders. Tasks are delegated ah. much further down the line. And it's simply that mm -hmm. the a service that serves the most people tends to get more attention. That's, that's a simple artifact of ah. how, you, how humans tick. So I see. what I think happens here is it's like a smaller part of the population. Mm -hmm. They do have services, but they are they don't get the attention that they uh, maybe could have yes. if there were more of them. So no, yeah. definitely not intention. If anything at all, I would say the Australian government tries to make things better. Okay, that, so that that's more the sociological effect of a bigger group in a yeah. in, in a certain group of people is a bigger one. I, I got the same in some other contexts where some people said you better regroup all the smaller group, all the smaller ones together because if shit happens on the big one, you are sure that the attention will be on the big one and not on the other ones. Okay, so that that's that's more of this effect. Yeah. I, I appreciate. The second I thing is yeah, between different countries. To be honest, so, sorry. I would love to compare between different countries. If we see the same kind of artifacts in other countries as well, and then we could well, compare uh, and do these qualitative studies. I had the, 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 the context I got was completely different. It was in big companies. In the big companies, for example, take a large telco. Uh, if they centralize the services, the, if shit happens to one, let's say to France or to Germany, you are sure they're going to, to get the attention. If yeah. you try to do that, if, if Switzerland or Denmark has a problem or Austria, it will be like, you know, at the end of the pipe, because first let's fix France and Germany. So yeah. you, you can find data in completely other contexts. I know this is not perhaps the, the right appropriate example, but it's interesting to see that it's exactly the same syndrome. It's the sociology of it. And I learned it through the CTO of uh, Orange itself who tell me, no, no, because the sociology key doesn't work, the model. Mm -hmm. The second yep. thing is a comment for later is I again see the shadow of cybersecurity as a big complication for people to access the services. Thank you. Mm, the big shadow. Sorry, I'm not sure I kind of follow here. No, I just note that in your presentation you characterize the fact that cybersecurity is a, an issue in the complication for people to access the services. Could be. Could be. 
maybe something we can pick up more in the discussion section. Yes. Uh, Drew, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. And I think, like, you know, uh, continuing on that discussion, one arm of government not talking to another arm, it's very, very common. And, like, it might not yeah. be intentionally done, but pretty common. One thing which I also wanted to pick on is, uh, is there any measurements that we could do that this kind of DNS uh, dependency have a tangible impact? Like, for instance, on measurement that says that the websites that are for indigenous population that are available or they go down much more, they are unavailable for a longer period of time. So is there some measurement that we could do that this, so that we can say that this DNS dependency is a reliable metric for us to realize that there is a digital divide right now. What, what I'm lacking right now is I understand it theoretically, but I wanna understand is there a tangible proof that what you are looking at would have a real impact on the lives of indigenous people yes uh, i think you're spot on um, that's what we should do and uh, i would like to do it that would be the next step for example do availability studies of these services it's important in this context to uh, also do abilities from australia so you really want to find out are these services available well available from the cities are they also available from the uh, outback or the more remote regions, uh, etc. Are they available via, Star via Starlink, maybe, for example? So uh, I, I would like to do these studies. Um, the question on the impact, I think, you know, I'm not sure if the DNS metrics are predictive for the overall state of accessibility. That would be a correlation that we still need to uh, to establish. I'm not sure yet about that, and I wouldn't want to say yes, it is. What I do want to say is. I think we found enough to encourage us to go after this. Thanks, sir. Great, thanks. Um, I put myself in the queue just, um, you know, as this discussion has progressed a little bit, I think I'm um, maybe bringing together a few ideas that have already been said by others, but I totally want to agree with you that there's a, there's a role for qualitative research in this area to really understand the underlying reasons, but I don't think that necessarily replaces the need for data uh, because, for example, you know, the intention of uh, the various agencies may not indicate bias um, or may not indicate, you know, malintent, um, but that doesn't mean that the overall effect isn't a negative impact, like a negatively impactful one because of bias, right? Um, and so actually being able to no matter the intention, actually demonstrate that there's a gap that further has, um, you know, a uh, an effect on inclusion, a negative effect on inclusion, and at the same time, like trying to trace back, you know, what uh, what has actually gone on. Like those are two; they serve like two separate functions. I think you don't get a full picture without both. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. But um, Corey, you you're the last in the queue. So why don't you go ahead? And also before we get to Corey, I just wanted to point out that Vesna has um, a handful of very useful comments in the chat. So you should uh, you know check those out. So um, Corey, go ahead. Thanks, Mallory. Um, Rob, just a quick factual question for you. Um, you, you mentioned uh, national and local DNS providers among your sample. Um, but just to connect to yesterday's discussion, did you see any DNS dependencies that were served by community or cooperative networks um, that would suggest a deliberate choice of infrastructure with different values than public cloud scalability um, as opposed to just an accidental digital divide? No, I followed yesterday's discussion a little bit. We didn't see uh, anything that would have stood out as a community network in any way. We saw the classic small scale providers, right? Um, SME and a little bit beyond. We saw a lot of that, but uh, not the community networks. Uh, thanks. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, and so we will uh, progress with our agenda. Um, and I believe Sarmad is up next. That is right. Okay. Just double checking myself. <laughs> and so also, um, Sarmad, if you would like me to share your slides, I can do so unless you would like to do that yourself. Just let me know. I have them um, ready and available. 
Uh, let me try if it uh, works from here, maybe not. So may I request you to please uh, share? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Just give me one moment. And so you'll just have to um, let me know when you want me to move forward. Sure. I'm just double checking. I have the right, <laughs> the right session. Okay, great. Um, are you able to see the slides? I am not able to, I see a, okay, it's appearing now. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. Go ahead. So, um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, so, this particular presentation is uh, on universal acceptance of domain names and uh, email addresses. Um, which, uh, of course, uh, is a key to uh, digital inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, um, you know, as a starting point, um, I guess uh, we are all aware that we live in a multilingual world um, with uh, lot of different languages uh, spoken by people natively and uh, of course uh, there are some languages which are spoken by very large uh, uh, populations so uh, if uh, we actually uh, have to um, eventually make uh, internet accessible uh, of course it has on online resources accessible they need to be in uh, in these languages as well uh, next slide please So, um, uh, where we are is uh, currently we have uh, 5.4 billion people uh, which are who are online today, um, and this means there are another um, about 2.7 billion people who will be joining uh, online over the next coming years. Uh, most of these people who are going to come online will come online from Africa and Asia, um, and. Uh, um, actually, many of the people who are already online also um, communicate in their language of choice uh, may actually not be English, even though they may uh, communicate uh, or talk in English where um, or or um, other languages which are using, uh, for example, Latin script. Um, and then so what uh, this does is that it presents a significant business and social opportunity for multilingual domain names globally. Um, domain names uh, obviously being a mechanism to access uh, the online content uh, in these different languages. Um, so the domain names obviously also need to be in local languages. Next slide, please. Um, so this was a need which was identified by the community early on. The works had started uh, on this. Uh, um, you know, there was reasonable work in the late 1990s. Um, IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, actually um, published uh, the internationalized domain names, um, RFCs, um, in around 2003, uh, which were eventually revised in 2010, uh, which is uh, called the IDN. An applications uh, standard or IDNA 2008 standard, which uh, allows for um, having domain names in local languages and scripts based on the Unicode standard. Um, so that uh, set up the basis on which uh, domain names actually could uh, then be implemented in local languages. Um, I can Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. Um, it uh, developed. Uh, uh, initial IDN implementation guidelines, 
uh, in 2003, uh, through which uh, then the top level domain registries uh, started offering uh, the domain names in local languages. Um, but uh, in most cases, the top level domain was still uh, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, earlier uh, TLD strings, uh, which included uh, ASCII uh, or um, uh, letters A through Z for um, top level domains. Uh, so the second level domain part was in a local language, but the top level was still uh, in ASCII. Um, and then what, of course, was required was that uh, a mechanism was needed to make the top level domains in uh, local languages as well. Uh, this was work which was done by the community. Um, and uh, eventually there were policies and uh, procedures which were defined through which uh, top level domains were also um, delegated to allow for the complete domain name to be in local language. And um, currently there are uh, 151 top level domains covering 37 languages and 23 scripts, which are delegated. Next slide, please. So these are examples of some of the country code uh, top level domains in local languages. Next slide, please. And these are some of the examples of the generic top level domains which are uh, delegated. Next slide, please. <coughs> so with these uh, TLDs now, it is uh, possible to have complete uh, domain names in local languages. Here are some examples of domain names uh, which we've actually registered. Um, and next slide, please. And uh, what this also allows uh, is to have uh, email addresses which are completely in local languages as well, um, um, based on the ITF uh, standards uh, to support internet email address internationalization, uh, which allows uh, for now uh, having Unicode uh, mailbox names uh, using IDNs on the right hand side of the ad sign or after the ad sign um, and uh, uh, Unicode based uh, strings uh, for the mailbox names, it is uh, now possible to have all these uh, local email addresses as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with all this uh, technology, of course, now possible, um, it um, to allow for uh, benefits for all this technology to reach out to all the users, um, the software and applications which uh, users use uh, should uh, also be able to uh, support uh, all these different kind of domain names and email addresses. Uh, however, what we found out was that uh, there is uh, a gap in the current applications. Um, so. Uh, in the second part of this slide, uh, you see um, sort of a, a example of a newsletter which uh, is asking for input ping and email address to subscribe to it. Um, what we did was we put in an Arabic uh, email address to subscribe to that address or sort of that newsletter. And if you can make the uh, message at the bottom, it says actually please enter a valid email address. Um, uh, so uh, what uh, this particular, um, I guess, uh, application or uh, website is doing is uh, even though um, these email addresses in local languages are now possible, uh, it is uh, programmed in a way that it only accepts um, input or email addresses in ASCII uh, strings um, or ASCII labels. Um, and uh, considers everything else uh, as invalid. Uh, and that uh, creates a significant barrier to access uh, such applications and websites for those uh, who are actually then eventually using these uh, internationalized domain names and email address internationalization. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, what um, um, we found out was that uh, this problem is not only limited uh, to internationalized domain names. Uh, very interestingly, uh, some of the applications, um, the way they check for domain names or email addresses, 
um, they they've uh, been more tuned to what was available before. So uh, earlier uh, in the um, earlier times, we we had uh, top level domains which which were restricted to 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 character uh, CCTLDs and also um, three to four character mostly, but uh, maximum up to maybe six character like dot museum um, for top level domains in ASCII. So uh, even with longer ASCII domains like dot engineering or dot international, which are longer than six characters, we'd find some uh, websites um, or applications which when they're validating the top level domain, they consider those as invalid and actually reject them as valid domain names um, and do not work for them. Uh, so there are all these different categories. In, in addition to the length, they also are uh, uh, some issues with uh, how the re how recently a domain name has been delegated. So even though IANA uh, maintains a latest list, uh, many of the software applications, or uh, at least some of them, um, hard code some of the some of these lists um, or uh, used third party sources to maintain these lists rather than looking it up from directly from IANA which means that some of these lists eventually become outdated and newer delegated top level domains are not available to these apl applications so uh, they may actually consider the new top level domains which are more recently delegated as invalid as well so you have the new top level domains the longer top level domains and the internationalized domain names um, uh, which face uh, acceptability challenges and then accordingly also um, ID, uh, Unicode based uh, mailbox names and email addresses also uh, face some of the similar challenges. And eventually, the, the goal is that all these different kinds of uh, domain names and email addresses should be accepted, validated, processed, stored, and displayed properly by all the different software applications uh, which are available. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've actually been doing some measurements as well, um, and um, uh, we uh, have some studies which are available online. The link is below. Uh, in this particular study, we were looking at um, um, 2,000 websites. We looked at uh, 1,000 globally available websites um, uh, using, uh, I guess, Alexa list. Um, but also, we looked at um, 20 different countries and took uh, 50 popular websites from each of those countries. And um, uh, from those countries, we were looking at um, government websites, um, bank websites, so financial institutions, websites, academia websites, media websites. Uh, and what we did was we actually went to their contact us page and we put in different kind of email addresses to, to uh, submit a comment. Uh, to see whether they would accept um, a particular email address or not. And on the left-hand side, you see uh, the kind of uh, email address which was put into that website. And um, the results uh, show the amount of acceptability of those uh, kinds of uh, email addresses. So new short at the bottom is like .sky, which is a, a new uh, top-level domain and uh, email addresses in ASCII. Uh, which were used to um, provide uh, about 90 to 93% acceptance. So that's reasonably high, but it's still not 100%. Uh, for the longer ones like dot engineering or dot international, um, uh, the acceptability of websites drops to about 80%, which means 200 of, uh, out of 1,000 websites, for example, say that uh, this is not a valid email address because uh, they do not recognize the top level domain, perhaps. Um, on the other side, if you're looking at, uh, for example, a Chinese, uh, put in a Chinese email address in websites, uh, the acceptability rate is very low. Uh, so not even 10% or 100 out of 1,000 websites would accept a Chinese email address. And, and more than a 900 will reject Chinese email address saying that it's an invalid email. They're just not able to process it. Um, and uh, this is not just for global websites. Uh, we actually went to um, China or you know in Middle East for uh, and used the Chinese or Arabic 
um, email addresses and we found similar results so so the issue is not just with the global websites but you know chinese websites in china are not accepting chinese email addresses arabic uh, um, um, websites in in um, arabic or uh, middle east for example are not accepting arabic uh, email addresses so so the the problem is uh, much more significant uh, even at the local local level next slide please um, we've also been uh, measuring uh, how many of the email servers uh, are supporting SMTP UTF-8 flag, uh, which is used uh, as an indicator that the server may be ready to uh, accept uh, email addresses in local languages. Um, what we do is we um, look at the GTLD zone files from uh, close to um, 1200 GTLDs. Uh, um, so we have about uh, a few, uh, 35 million uh, MX records registered in those zone files. Uh, and what we do is we ping these uh, MX records to find out if the server, email server at the back, is able to accept, uh, for example, a Chinese or a Cyrillic or a, um, internationalized email address. And uh, what we've been finding out, we do this uh, once a quarter, and what we've been finding out is that uh, currently uh, about 22% of the email servers are uh, responding with an SMTP UTF-8 flag. Uh, rest, uh, some don't respond, or uh, some of them, of course, uh, do not uh, return uh, or acknowledge that flag. Uh, and there's a link uh, at the bottom here, uh, which shows uh, more detailed data. Um, so next slide, please. So there is a significant problem, right? Um, the, from a website perspective, around 10% uh, for internationalized email uh, addresses and from email servers, about uh, about 22%. Um, so um, I guess uh, there is a gap. Uh, the technology is available, but people who would want to use the technology cannot effectively use it because uh, the applications just don't allow you to uh, use it. Um, other examples uh, which are not presented here include uh, you know you using an Arabic or a Chinese or a Cyrillic uh, uh, email address to sign up for, for example, a social media application like um, you know Facebook or Twitter, uh, and you would see that uh, you are not able to sign with. Uh, uh, many of these social media applications, we actually have a study online which actually does that exercise and shares uh, the results and the results are not very good. Uh, so it just uh, blocks access uh, to all these people who want to use and communicate in their local languages. Uh, there is obviously a role to play by different stakeholders. Academia uh, needs to um, um, include this uh, um, education around uh, how to manage uh, Unicode internationalization, but more specifically also IDNs and internationalized email addresses in their uh, coursework. Next slide, please. Um, businesses um, need to um, um, be a little more cognizant of, uh, of these uh, business opportunities in this area, but also uh, updating their design, uh, um, I guess, design principles uh, as they develop appli these applications. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, of course, uh, governments have a very significant role to play uh, if they want to serve their citizens who may actually be using a local language. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, their uh, local e-government services support those local languages which are spoken by their citizens their procurement policies uh, allow for that requirement uh, to be programmed into the software and services they're acquiring. Um, and uh, they, of course, um, by creating that demand, they can uh, motivate the businesses to uh, update uh, their uh, design principles as well. And then, of course, governments uh, should also be um, um, monitoring uh, their development uh, um, along along uh, IDN and universal acceptance uh, uh, by by 
I guess monitoring different uh, indicators. Some of them are listed here. Uh, next slide, please. So if you go to UASC, which stands for Universal Acceptance Steering Group, uh, which is part of ICANN community, USG.tech, uh, you'll find many useful resources and studies which look at all the different kinds of software um, um, and how they work or do not work with uh, um, these kinds of email addresses. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, and there are additional resources which are available through ICANN as well. Uh, which uh, you which are available online. Here are some links, uh, and you can also get more information through these uh, email addresses. And uh, thank you very much. And it's back to you, Andrew. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm going to um, go ahead and manage the queue a little bit. Um, I'll put myself in it first. Uh, just this maybe opens up a huge can of worms, so I apologize, but um, I wonder I, your slide number four um, made me realize actually, no, it wasn't four, um, made me realize that actually some of these um, um, scripts actually make the dots and the dashes and even the aroba is that what we call it the the at sign difficult to see. Was there ever any question about whether or not these uh, symbols should uh, also be changed. I imagine not, but just curious. So, uh, in Chinese, for example, uh, they use an open dot, which is uh, they don't have a regular dot on their keyboard. Uh, uh -huh. This is actually true for many languages. Uh, most of the local language keyboards do not have a dot and an at sign. Uh, so, we see this an uh, issue. Um, um, in uh, you know, in some countries, what they're doing is they're actually adding dots and at sign as part of their keyboard standard to, you know, make sure that uh, at least this part is covered. But yes, uh, Chinese open dot is an example. Um, there are um, you know there are um, dot equivalent uh, characters in many other scripts as well. So and and the at sign is very indigenous too. I guess Latin script is not something which is universal, right? As well, so so yes, uh, those things have uh, come up, um, but uh, I think we are uh, even trying to solve uh, simpler problems. Those those could become much more complicated to solve. Thank you. Wow, that's that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that going back to the actual queue, uh, Dhruv is first. Yeah, uh, thanks. Very interesting presentation. Uh, one thing which I note in India is uh, I also note that we don't have very good free uh, in itself. Like even I was trying to uh, set up one for my family members and I could not find a very good reliable one out there. So even that is a, a, a problem. And one thing which is happening in India specifically is mobile numbers. Every website now just asks you to use mobile numbers and OTPs. Uh, for everything which people find convenient, but at the same time, they are like, you know, you don't have any anonymity anymore. Privacy is going away. Everything is so tightly linked to a mobile number and your KYC, etc. But that's a trend I wanted to share, at least in India, that people, though we want email to succeed, people are in fact going away from email. Uh, people who have a uh, difficulty, uh, like writing in Latin script are using mobile numbers, are using non-email softwares for communication, like WhatsApp and this is what they do. They feel like they can work without an email and get almost the same set of services over the internet as well, which we want, which we preferably don't want, but that's something which I wanted to share at least from my part of the world. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was that's really helpful. Drew. Thanks for sharing. Um, Miria, you're next. Yeah, thank you um, for presenting some measurement data here. That's always interesting to see. Um, but I have the feeling the problem is much bigger, right? How like, what does it help me if I can subscribe in my um, own letters or language to an email list where the content is not written in that language? Um, and so, you know, that has a big impact. And so I'm wondering 
if we also have some more data of that. And then as a second thought, it's also, I feel there is a little bit of a trend to have that more and more that it's more and more common that people learn Latin letters in other countries and other regions of the world. I'm not good. I'm not saying that's a solution. I'm just wondering, like, did it change over the years? Have we any data on that as well? Uh, thank you. May I respond to that? Um, yeah, please. Sure. Sure. So, um, I think, um, uh, what you're talking, the initial comment was more around content, right? And it actually goes both ways. Um, so, so I have uh, many uh, colleagues, uh, you know, who are very well versed in English, for example, they've gone to Western universities, done degrees, but when they come back home, they would uh, still want to read the newspaper in the local language. Uh, but to read that newspaper in the local language, they still have to type the domain name in English. Um, so, so the content is in local language, but the domain name is in English and, um, you know, they can manage because they're obviously well versed in both scripts. Um, but for those, uh, people, uh, who are not as well versed in, uh, a foreign script, uh, if they use a local script and that's all they use. Uh, and there was actually a very good example shared by a colleague of mine, uh, who's actually Greek. And her grandmother uh, is, uh, of course, Greek, and she wants, uh, she, you know, she's uh, um, very well read, but in Greek, not in English uh, or uh, any other language using Latin alphabet. So, so she could go on the internet, she could read Greek content, but to actually go and find the website uh, using a foreign set of uh, characters, it becomes a barrier for her to access that content. Uh, so it sort of works in uh, opposite in that direction as well. Um, that, uh, you know, um, uh, there is already plenty of content online in local languages, uh, but, uh, the accessible, uh, the key to that, the URL, the address part, um, uh, is very significantly constrained, uh, from an accessibility point of view. Maybe just to uh, add to that one a little more. So, I mean. I totally understand the problem and it's a barrier to access, but I think there are actually potentially different solutions for it that we at least should consider. Because, for example, you said, like, people can read pages, but they cannot find the pages. But I know a lot of people who actually don't know what the domain, what the line where you enter the domain in your browser means. They kind of use Google to find whatever they need, right? Um, and so, and I think the same is true for the example that Truth was using that People don't use email that anymore that much anymore. They use their phone number to authenticate with all kinds of services. Um, so it's it's a little bit also an artifact about how we interact with the services. And that is like language is meant to be human readable, but it doesn't have to be actually language how we interact. It could also be a search interface or whatever. So I think we can think like a little bit broader about this problem as well. Certainly, I think there's space for all these things. Uh, but I guess what uh, we are arguing is that uh, um, at least that smaller space which exists for email addresses and domain names should at least work properly. Thanks. Um, Hannah, you're next. Uh, thank you, Sermant. Thanks, Sermant. I have a question also on the on the data particular to uh, to email addresses and subscriptions. Uh, when looking at the websites, did you take any note uh, of the um, uh, systems that are these websites are built, built using uh, content management systems, or if they have um, reused libraries for email verification and so on? Because, well, that can be an area where we can work on very quickly. Yes. Uh, so yes, we did. Um... So, so, for example, um, one of the uh, constraining factor uh, we found out was, uh, you know, we know that about 40% of the websites currently are hosted on uh, WordPress. Uh, and um, uh, WordPress has this uh, plugin, uh, which does not support uh, um, internationalized uh, domain names and email addresses. Um, and that obviously causes a barrier for at least these, uh, uh, these websites. Uh, we've also um, 
looked at uh, libraries which are uh, offered in the different programming languages in Python, Java, JavaScript. Uh, the, the link I shared uh, towards the end of my slides, you can actually go to that website and look at uh, um, the analysis we've done for programming languages, li libraries, uh, um, authentication tools, content management systems. Uh, we've also looked at uh, social media applications. And so there's a host of these studies uh, which we've done and we've actually documented uh, you know what works and what doesn't work and why and we have actually found uh, you know so there are for example uh, some libraries um, in python well python 3 now actually has the the idea the library is now uh, compliant um, but uh, java for example there are multiple libraries uh, some are not compliant some are compliant with idna 2003 which is the older version and therefore probably not recommended uh, and uh, there's obviously still some libraries which are compliant with IDNA 2008, uh, and uh, some applications may actually be using the other library, and that's why it doesn't work. Uh, so yes, um, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of data on that website, uh, which indicates what the issues are and how to also resolve those issues. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ralph, you're up next. Yep, let me unmute. So thank you too. Uh, a quick question maybe. You seem to advocate a kind of migration path in terms of software that is deployed. Um, do you have an, an estimate maybe just how painful is it at the moment? Because when people have to update software, they normally think about how painful is the current process or the current state and how uh, painful is it going to be if I have to upgrade everything? Do you think that's possible? Do you think there will be enough buy-in or is it just going to be what a few others have advocated saying that, okay, maybe we just drop email as a, a way to have internationalized uh, domains and use them? So there are sort of two parts to this, right? Uh, as you are alluding as well, um, that uh, there's a path which is, um, you know, just the organic growth that over time, uh, you know, VR and the community, everybody's raising awareness that these things exist. Uh, libraries are starting to support them. Uh, sometimes we actually go out and work with uh, uh, these library um, developers and you know put in a bug fix or um, report a bug, uh, and that's uh, I guess uh, incorporated. So over and then when that library uh, makes it to the application's new version or updated version, the application will eventually start uh, working as well. So there's sort of some organic uh, growth and that's sort of what uh, I think is also indicative uh, uh, from from the chart which I was showing from the EAI measurements we are doing um, that uh, you see that uh, you know over quarters uh, the number of email servers uh, which uh, are supporting internationalized email addresses is growing from like 20 to you know now 22 percent to about two percent over the last two three years um, uh, but that's too slow. Um, what we want, of course, is uh, something which is, uh, I guess, radically faster than that. You know, we don't want another hundred years to get there. Yeah. Um, and to do that, um, eventually, governments um, need to really, for example, uh, the community icon community thinks governments are a very significant stakeholder because the day they say that our procurement policies will require our local languages to be supported in all the e-government services we are acquiring or systems we're acquiring for the government so that they can better serve the citizens. It creates a huge demand and then businesses can very quickly react to that. It's not that the businesses are unable to do it. It's just that the motivation is not there because of course the demand's not there. Yeah, yeah, um, that's what I completely so, agree with, yes. Uh, I saw that in previous you know, few years ago when we tracked the migration to newer cryptographic protocols and there's the same case. Of course, it's better to use the new thing. Of course, it's better to use IDN domains, etc. Um, it's just how painful is it at the moment? And uh, I, I agree with you. If you have government government regulation and forcing it, that might be the way to get them to pay attention to it and to actually deploy it. Yeah, and not just uh, regulation, right? More also the incent business incentive uh, by government asking them to do it for them as a client. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah. Um, so I think uh, it is. Are not straightforward, especially if you're running very complex systems. 
but uh, of course with the right motivation it can be done thanks so much um so last in the queue is arnaud go ahead uh, yes, so thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And I, I understand your, your intention is to, first of all, keep the basic at work, which, which I do understand. I do understand absolutely the migration pains because I, for reasons in my own career, uh, on how painful it is to migrate to all of these things. And, and anyway, my, my point is a different one. My point is that the, unfortunately, the, this internationalization, which is desirable, has helped one category of people who are the cyber criminals because, because they have such a rich set of characters now, they can, they can help their social attacks by, for example, making a little dot, using a character that has a little dot below the A or something to, to make you believe you go to your bank account, but you don't go to your bank account. And, and I find it like a, an unfortunate complication in, in, in this whole story because imagine elderly people and other people who are not, who are not paying attention, who are just tired or whatever, that will click because they miss this little dot or this little subtlety on the character that they just don't see. And, and I find it like a real danger for, for the adoption. And, and for me, that's a real obstacle and as, as, as part of social engineering attacks to uh, to the access of the service. So, I, I, is this something you've you've considered, or you have data on, or just naive? Thank you. Um, so, yes, um, what you're saying is correct. Uh, those kind of uh, uh, variations in uh, um, the glyphs and code points is are exploited, um, and. Um, uh, I would also say yes. Uh, we've actually I can with its community has worked very significantly to address this through two measures. Uh, one is to actually get the right data, uh, and then also uh, to have uh, you know the right set of uh, policies and procedures. Um, so so on both fronts. Uh, just to give you an example of uh, what we've done on the data front uh, for the top level domains. Uh, for example, uh, you're very right uh, that when we go from ASCII, which is, uh, you know, uh, if you look in at uh, top level domains, uh, which are just, uh, you know, which are alphabetic, uh, you have uh, the 26 uh, um, letters and maybe 26 capital forms in ASCII. So that's 52 letters. Uh, but when you go to uh, Unicode, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, 150,000 letters. So that's a huge uh, leap. Um, so, so for for top level domains, uh, we've actually um, uh, done a very um, uh, you know a, a very careful process where we include uh, one script at a time. Uh, we've actually worked with all the different script communities over the last uh, I would say ten years from twenty thirteen to now twenty twenty three and now twenty four. Um, where uh, for each of these scripts, uh, we actually put a panel together. Uh, just to give an example for the Arabic script uh, uh, rules for developing top level domains, uh, we put a panel together which had about 30 plus members from 20, 22 countries, um, which were using Arabic script. They all came together, looked at all the different characters in, in the Unicode uh, Arabic uh, code charts, and um, actually um, devised very detailed analysis of which code points should be used, which shouldn't be used, which could be considered confusing uh, with others to the extent that they should be quote unquote, you know, what we call variants of each other. Uh, and what are some other rules to constrain? For example, mm -hmm. in Arabic, if you're familiar, there are optional diacritics used and the, mm -hmm. the, this team suggested that diacritics should not be used in domain names because they co will cause unnecessary confusions. Uh, so the for the top level domains, uh, we do not allow diacritics, for example, because based on that uh, assessment from the community. So we've done this uh, community based analysis of the scripts by these script communities for all the different scripts, which we are including for top level domains. And this, um, uh, this work has taken us 10 years. Uh, and, I, you know, I share the link in the chat, but uh, it's very interesting work. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we not only document the solution uh, in what is called the label generation rule format, which is uh, RFC 7940. Um, um, but uh, also uh, these uh, communities uh, document a very detailed document uh, sharing their design decisions and why they considered something uh, allowed and not allowed or uh, allowed in certain conditions. So, so there's a wealth of data which has been generated by ICANN community to, to address these uh, security concerns, precisely to address the concerns you are raising. And I'll share these links in the chat. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sarmad, and thanks for everyone for engaging in uh, the discussion. We will come back to this um, after the final talk to discuss in general all of the presentations. So, um, please, can I invite our last speaker? Uh, would you like to control your own slides or would you like me to present for you? Yeah, I'll control my slides. Give me a minute. Right. You should be able to if you have permission on your desktop. Okay. Right. A bit of a permission issue. But let me would it be okay if I rejoin? Yes, yeah, that's no problem. I had to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. Again. So yeah, go ahead. We'll see you in a right moment. Back. Awesome. So sorry for the inconvenience. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. Is it visible? Yep. We can see that and we can hear you. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you, Mallory, for moderating and Ralph and Sarmat. Those were great presentations. Um, an introduction of myself. I'm Ramesa Habib. I'm a first year PhD student at Stanford. I'm currently being advised by Zakir. But the work I'm going to be talking about today is uh, something I worked on last year uh, during my undergrad at LUMS Pakistan. So the, this work is called a framework for improving web affordability and inclusiveness. Uh, it was submitted and uh, presented at SICOM last year. And these are my wonderful co-authors. Our work essentially answers three questions. How worldwide is access to the World Wide Web? How would stakeholders benefit from web equity? And how do we work towards equitable web access? Let's talk about that first question. And to understand it, we must look at the key barriers that are currently limiting people from viewing the internet. There are a bunch of them, such as a lack of coverage, censorship, but the barrier that we focus on in our work is cost of web access. This is defined by two things. Firstly, broadband price, which is how much it costs a user per byte, and web page size, which is the total number of bytes that a user must buy in order to access a web page. We know the cost of web access is a key barrier because of a survey conducted by the World Bank in 11 emerging countries, which showed that nearly half of the respondents had difficulty paying for their mobile data usage. This trend isn't getting any better, though, as we see an increase in the complexities of user experience. We find that web page sizes have been on the rise, while broadband prices have been largely stagnant. This means that each access to a web page has become more and more expensive. Access isn't equally expensive everywhere, however, as we see variations in both broadband price and web page size. So we analyzed broadband prices across 206 countries using the ITU dataset, and we measured and analyzed the web complexity of the Alexa top thousand sites across 99 countries. This culminated in a total dataset of around 72,000 web pages. Zooming into broadband price, 
The UN Broadband Commission considers broadband in a region to be affordable if it costs 2% or less of that region's gross national income per capita. We found that 94 countries don't meet this target for a 2 GB data only plan. As for web complexity, we also see uh, some discrepancies, especially across developing and developed regions. So I'm just going to be talking about non cash page sizes. We have some analysis for when we also consider caching in our full paper. But uh, yeah, so in developing regions, we find that the average page size is 2.87, which is larger than uh, what we find in developed regions, which is 2.64 MB. And this is basically telling us that the most popularly accessed sites in developing regions just tend to be larger in size. This is alluding to regional differences in what websites we're accessing. And I have some work on public websites uh, when we can see this clear discrepancy uh, when we're talking about region specific uh, web pages and how they're less likely to be optimized. So, to quantify affordability on both these fronts, broadband price and web complexity, uh, we devised a novel fairness metric called the PAW index. And the intuition behind it is that it's essentially telling us the reduction required in average page size in a region to equalize web access around the world. So a power of greater than one would indicate unaffordable access. So things need to be optimized here. As you can see in this graph uh, with the red dotted line indicating a power of one, a lot of developing countries currently don't meet this target. Uh, to be more specific, 48 out of the 96 countries in our data set have a power of greater than one for at least one plan. So now we know uh, that this is an issue, uh, we can talk about how stakeholders would benefit if we addressed it. Let's talk about the more obvious stakeholders, which are the users. Do they want their web pages reduced? Because there is this inherent trade off between quality of a web page and number of accesses. If you want more accesses, you're gonna have to be served a lower quality, reduced web page with lower sizes. But do users want that trade-off? To uh, answer this question, we conducted a user study with 100 participants, and in which we showed them 10 web pages with varying levels of reduction. We found that a significant number of users were actually willing to trade off web page quality for an increased number of accesses. And again, uh, a more detailed analysis of this can be found in the full paper. There are, of course, other stakeholders here. So, for example, website operators and mobile network operators. And we believe both of them stand to benefit as we are lowering the barrier of access to the internet, leading to more users coming online and increasing revenue for them. So, now that we know that this problem exists, it matters, and people are actually willing to adopt solutions. We can move on to the third and final question, which is how do we work towards equitable web access? And here I introduce our solution framework, Affordable Web for All. AW4A is a transcoding service which considers both affordability and the quality of the web page. But before I get into the details of AW4A, what went wrong with prior work? Essentially, they suffered from some inherent design flaws. A bunch of them broke pages, rendering them completely unusable for the users. Uh, some of them lacked web developer consent in a way that impacted revenue uh, in the form of ads and just breaking the pages so they couldn't be used for their intended purpose. Moreover, Facebook free basics violated net neutrality principles. In fact, it was banned in India for this very reason. Google Weblight broke end to end encryption because of the way they used proxies. So, considering the weaknesses of prior work, we settled on two main goals and principles. Firstly, we want to adapt sizes based on affordability. And to do this, we find the target page size by using PAW index, uh, the affordability metric I introduced earlier. Secondly, we want to consider user privacy and web developer consent. And to do this, we do transcoding on the server side and without the usage of any proxies. 
AW4A is essentially just solving an optimization problem, which aims to maximize page quality given a page size constraint. And here we define page quality as a weighted average of the individual qualities of the individual objects on the page. We know that this problem is NP hard, however, and the proof for this is in the appendix of our paper. Um, but this is why we approximate a solution using a two stage approach. In the first stage, we apply optimizations which would have no impact on quality. So this would be low hanging fruit, such as uh, JavaScript minification or gzip compression. If the target page size has been reached at this point, then well and good, we return a transcoded page. But we know through our experiments that a lot of pages won't reach the target just with these optimizations. So these would move on to stage two. Here we apply optimizations which may impact quality, such as reducing the quality of an image or debloating JavaScript. And since we're impacting quality here, we wanna do this in a strategic fashion. So let's zoom in a bit on stage two. For, stu for stage two, we devised and implemented two algorithms. Firstly, we have grid search, which is a naive brute force approach. And essentially it's searching a discretized space of possible optimizations. This results in high quality web pages. However, it has an exponential runtime which means it's not very suitable for more dynamic pages that may need to be transcoded more regularly. Which is why we also have a heuristics based approach, HPS, which uses a set of heuristics and results in slightly lower quality pages as compared to grid search, but it does run in linear time. So that's a big plus. Uh, I won't go into details for the heuristics, but I wanna give you a sense of the intuition so we consider two image heuristics, area on the web page and bytes efficiency. Uh, for area on the web page, as you can see here, finer details like the wrinkles on the flag tend to get lost in smaller images. So we prefer to reduce these because changes to it would be less visible to the naked eye. Secondly, we consider bytes efficiency because in our experiments we found that some images just tend to handle reduction better this can be a product of like how they're encoded or just different colors that are used on them. But what this essentially means is for the same change in visual quality, we found that some images would give you a greater bytes reduction. So we would prefer to reduce those images. Uh, again, I won't go into heuristics, but I can attest to their effectiveness. In our experimentation, we found that half of the pages that we reduced with HBS uh, maintain a quality of 0 0.98 or higher. We also conducted a small scale user study uh, against two alternate solutions to reducing web page sizes, Brave and Opera Mini, which are browser level solutions. And we found that users slightly preferred HBS, even though it gave you slightly more reduction. So we found that it was strictly better in these cases. So in conclusion, we show that lack of affordability is a key barrier in accessing the web. Users are willing to trade quality for quantity of access, and there are practical solutions to improve affordability. You can contact us here. Uh, that's my email address, and that's uh, the email address of my co-first author, Sara. You can see our source code for our implementations of HPS and grid search at the following link, or check out the full paper for more details such as about caching and a bunch of other results that are pretty interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you so much. Um, excellent presentation and paper. Um, would folks like to enter the queue? Uh, Dhruv, go ahead. Yeah, hi, very interesting uh, presentation. Your paper is excellent. One thing that comes to my mind is also, is there a correlation between uh, What's the, basically what I mean to say is like, what will be the tangible difference once this has been implemented? Why I'm asking this question is especially like in my part of the world, I see the v amount of uh, data spent on website would be very much limited compared to apps, for instance. And even if we reduce the data on some website, would it actually lead to uh, a tangible change in, in the life of uh, people who have issues affording 
this thing. So could this be easily applied to apps as well, or it would be very difficult to do it? That part I wanted to understand. Would your research lead to good stuff even in the application sites? Yeah, uh, just like uh, first talking about the first thing, ads are definitely a part of the op objects we can optimize. I, 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 sh I think I shouldn't have stopped sharing so I can, um, no, second. Oops, wrong. Great. Yeah, um, so ads is definitely one of the objects we can optimize. So here where we're optimizing web objects, it could be images, JavaScript, it could also be advertisements. Um, the reason that we don't make it explicit, you know, which objects you should optimize, and especially like with ads, it's kind of like, should we do it, should we not, is because it's tied very directly to uh, the revenue of the web developer. And that's that's kind of like a major thing that we noticed with prior work. The web developer's consent wasn't really taken into account here. Um, with solutions such as Brave, that makes it makes sense that you would want to remove these ads, but then it's like, you know, these trade-offs that you're not sure you want to make here. Um, I do think that there would be a tangible difference. I'm sure in a lot of countries, developed countries, maybe not so much, because at least in the US, there's this trend of having like unlimited data plans, in which case it doesn't really matter too much. But in a lot of developing countries, um, like we could see in the uh, World Bank survey that uh, I referenced in the beginning, or the user study that we conducted, it was conducted in Pakistan. I guess that's some uh, yeah, insight that I should have mentioned before. Um, people do want to make this trade off because they do find that their data plans are limited. These approaches could be mapped to applications, and that's definitely like a really good point and an avenue for future work that we, we've been uh, thinking about. How we get more and more people, for example, like YouTube and Facebook, we use the app more than we do the website. Um, the concept, I believe the algorithms that we use could be mapped there. There would definitely need to be a lot of implementation changes to get it to that level, though. But you raise a really good point. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I was um, actually going to say something similar because I know that's one of the main reasons why people use ad blockers, right? Is they're, they don't want to pay for the pleasure of being advertised to. Um, but I guess I would modify then my question slightly. Um, it, it also, I wonder if you also are thinking beyond just web pages. Um, because I think another place where folks are worried about their data usage is in messaging apps where other people are putting loads of pictures, PDFs in their messenger. And so I know like some messengers work differently than others and those that are a little bit more data use conscious, like blur that out or yeah. sort of give the user an option to uh, download it before the app itself will present those immediately. So I, are you also looking at those? Because I, I feel like the way that those apps is actually the thing that you want, right? You want users to be opting in to the thing that they want to look at, whether it's a web page or it's a or it's a messaging application. Yeah, yeah. The philosophy of those approaches are definitely like part of what we are uh, trying to say as well. Um, like, uh, I know Twitter also does that with the blurring and if you want to look at it and there's a lot of options such as for WhatsApp as well, if you don't want to automatically download. I think these are very much in tune with what we are trying to say. It's, and these are things that I believe developers just need to be more conscious of. And while we do provide this sort of like package solution, I think the, the main the uh, insight of our work is this is something the developers just need to think about, even if they don't use our solution, which I'm sure doesn't work for a lot of um, things such as like apps or like uh, these messaging sites, um, our solution might not work in those cases. Um, but it's also we're providing this measurement to show you, hey, you have these potential users um, just make these small changes and they can come online. Thank you. And uh, in the queue next um, is Machuki. Hey, Machuki. Mallory, uh, and thank you for the presentation uh, on my side. Um, I have a question with respect to, I think it was on your second slide. Um, you refer to this as broadband. Um, sorry. Yeah. 
you refer to this as the broadband, but from my understanding when it comes to broadband prices, there are two uh, uh, sort of variants to this, which is fixed broadband and mobile broadband. And what tends, what users tend to be more sensitive to is mobile broadband because that's where it's charged or billed, um, um, has uh, uh, billing caps that are based on data bundles or pack packages that are data driven as opposed to fixed broadband where you have fiber and the cost tend to be uh, based on a monthly usage of a particular uh, capacity that you have. But I'm curious to to see whether in, in your research and based on this statement uh, here, it's actually looking across both mobile and fixed, because I do know there are some countries where they also have fixed connectivity. I think South Africa was one country where uh, that was a major issue um, around uh, uh, fixed broadband that had data caps. Um, but I don't know whether the other countries that you may have seen that have a similar approach to billing for fixed connectivity. Yeah, uh, in in our work, we limit ourselves to mobile broadband. So the, the particularly these three plans that we see across in all countries, which is the data only plan, data voice, low usage data, high uh, voice usage. Um, and these were like defined by the ITU. So we borrowed off of the definition for broadband and the prices from there. There was the option of considering fixed broadband. Uh, but we felt that mobile usage, especially in developing countries, is more, uh, it's just much more common. Um, in, in, in developing countries, we don't see much usage, in a lot of developing countries at the very least, we don't see too much penetration of fixed broadband as compared to uh, mobile data. It's just, it's just something that's more accessible. So that's why we limited ourselves to uh, mobile broadband. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Uh, so it looks like we've um, drained the queue on this particular one, but so I'll in, I'll have us I'll have you uh, stop sharing. So yes, we'll all get back into the the big room. Um, turn your cameras on if you don't mind. If you'd feel comfortable doing that, because now is the time where we want to have a broader discussion, keeping in mind these questions of. You know, what can the IETF do about these things? And I also want to highlight just how different, but also so perfectly on task everyone's presentations were, right? We first talked about this issue of uh, barrier to access being the accessibility of the service itself. And then we talked about even the accessibility of then the content um, and the technical issue behind that. And then we ended with this really excellent um, question around cost, like, is it really sustainable? Um, so there, and there are more, maybe there, if we had, you know, more presentations, we could cover all the grounds. So maybe there's also a question of, you know, what's missing, what we haven't discussed, but again, like very, very curious, everyone's thoughts on what can be done. Where should this work continue? And you can, um, continue to use the queue as you have been so that we can, uh, make sure everyone gets a chance to speak and we have roughly. You know, 40 minutes uh, for this discussion. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we'd love to hear your reflections on this. Yeah, um, so I'm of the opinion that I, I think these, these conversations should, um, while a lot of them are springing from, you know, technical researchers, uh, I don't think it ends there. I think a lot of these issues need to um, be brought forward to like, to a governmental level, because at least at least through my research that I've noticed that a lot of these problems are systematic and a lot of people just don't in, in, in these in these positions of power don't have this technical awareness for it. So there's kind of this bridge that needs to be uh, there's this gap that needs to be uh, covered. Um, and I, I, I like I'm, I'm ready to like brainstorm how this can be done because we have so many different like landscapes on, on how technology works in so many different countries. Um, and while we do have like internet standard for some things, it's like you just when you when you speak completely different languages, how how do you bridge that? Um, and that that's my uh, thoughts on this.
Marie, Maybe, Marie. Uh, yeah. Can, yeah, can yeah, I quickly, I do you can I quickly ask you? Do you mean bridging this gap by more measurement or also by um, finding more better solutions or give those? I think it's just like getting the measurements and solutions to the right people. Because I, I think it's like I, I had this big philosophical question after my work, which is like, what do I do with it? Like, I'll present it here. I'll talk to these people about it, but I found myself more and more just talking to the same technical people. And it's like, how do I elevate this work? And I've been trying to do that in Pakistan, but, but it's like, um, there's this sort of disorganization. Also, they just don't understand this technical language that I speak and like. It's like, I feel like it's, it's the issue goes like before that, you know, how do you communicate the results uh, better to these positions in power? And just to dig in, follow up on that, this is Lai from Measurement Lab. And our experience too, I think part of the, there's definitely the translation between um, the different, you know, uh, areas of expertise. And I think part of it is that the technical community often will come with several different solutions and everyone saying ours is the best. And so in terms of what the IETF can do or just standards bodies in general, I feel like it's that consensus building work in terms of offering um, parsable, accessible, uh, consensus driven solutions such that they're not choosing one and then immediately turning around and being told by another expert that theirs is actually better and that they did it wrong and they need to start over. <laughs> so having, I think in terms of um, what the bodies can do, it's like helping put in that um, work so that the technical experts can be on the same page such that when we do go to the governments, um, they have a better uh, chance at just choosing one solution. Um, looking at the queue, Arno, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's, I think, um, th there are a couple of ideas, uh, uh, you know, for what concerns, what the ATF could be doing. Uh, I think there are a couple of issues here that, that are popping up. Back to the measurement point, I was really interested by Ralph, uh, uh presentation earlier because what if we would come with exactly a, a, a neutral measurement of these things so that people who are not even aware that they are biasing the situation then can fix themselves? Uh, and developing such an index or measurement is not easy at all and, and could be a work on itself. Uh, that's, that's one way that, that the ATF may want to consider. The other thing is, for me, uh, a clear issue is the operational community that seems to have disappeared from the ATF. Um, here, I think there is a more fundamental problem because uh, a lot of the issues are about migrations, about how people operate, how people manage, how people. But these people are not in the ATF anymore, and that's an issue that that people should perhaps recognize in the ATF. And then, if we recognize it, then what are we doing with it? The third problem I have is, of course, with security. Because security is a complication and it shadowed from yesterday's nearly all plantation and today's plantation and, and we can't ignore it. I mean, as a bias, the cyber criminals are making eight trillion, six trillion dollars of business. That's a 10% of the worldwide GDP. Imagine the damage it is causing to the entire world on how people can access things. And we are not recognizing it. So, three ideas, um, that's it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to jump in a discussion? Do you want to? Um, yeah, Michuki, go ahead. Okay. There you go. Um, so I, I wanted to respond to Ram, uh, Ramaisa's question around uh, what do you do with this? I, th I think it's a very valid question. And uh, um, in the work that we've been doing at the Internet Society, one of the things that we came to learn quickly is that um, when we speak tech to business and policy makers, we sort of lose them within the first five minutes of the conversation. And so we need to sort of understand how to speak business and policy um, through the data that we 
collect from the work that we do from the technical uh, work. And so um, it, it sort of needs to, uh, we need to sort of get to a point where we are telling those stories using that data. Like can be understood by the target audience we're trying to speak to. Um, and we've tried this, this to an extent, I'll not say we are 100% successful, but to a certain extent we, we are uh, successful. I'll give an example. Um, we, we, we've been trying to report on something called uh, government mandated internet shutdowns, which also create a barrier to digital divide, get more people to, you know, have uh, lower their interest in adopting the internet for uh, things that they want to use uh, at a critical level. We were trying to understand what's the best way to communicate this, and we came up with something we call the net loss tool. And the net loss tool is sort of trying to calculate what's the cost of an internet shutdown. And the moment we presented this, showing the government, whenever you have an internet shutdown, this is the cost that you have on the internet economy. This is how much for indirect investment you lose. This is the how much. Uh, you lose with respect to um, income that people who are depending. And then they were able to pay attention to, oh, okay, so these internet shutdowns do actually have an impact on the economy. And it's going against, um, you know, what really we are trying to work um, for, um, of, uh, to sort of work on. So it's trying to use, look at the data that you, you have and see how we can we actually turn this into something that can actually be uh, uh, of relevance um, to the target audience we're speaking to. So it's 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 really um, not something that we are accustomed to as techies. I think we sort of get lost in the data, but I, it's also a skill set that we need to develop or work with groups that are actually very good at doing this. And so that's something I'll encourage you to sort of keep thinking at the local level. I think in Pakistan, I would encourage you to look at the, uh, we have a great internet society chapter there. Maybe there's conversations that you can have with them to start that there. But also I think at the ITF level, um, I think is that um, bringing together various stakeholder groups that can help interpret this data into something that can speak to different tag, uh, target audiences. Other thoughts and just to plug tomorrow's session. Um, is all day or all day, two hours on censorship, because um, that is obviously a really big element. And I think one thing I wanted to draw out, because uh, I know we're talking about it, but just to remind us that it is about the inequality in access. So that, yes, there are challenges, and some of those challenges persist everywhere. There are certainly hard things to do on the internet, but this is particularly when there is. Um, you know, this issue of, of gap between for those whom it's solved, for those whom the government website works and is available um, in a language that is comfortable for them um, and they can afford it. And then there are people who are expected or maybe imagined to, to also need those same resources, but that for whatever reason cannot get them as equally. And so I think that's the piece where, you know, we really have to think about you know, what's what's driving that. Um, okay, Lai, go ahead. Yeah, this might already exist, so this might just be my own um, ignorance of the IETF, but um, I was compelled earlier by the mentions of the need for field work and maybe other qualitative studies um, to help kind of contextualize some of the research that's being done. And so just maybe providing basic frameworks for different kinds of studies to consider. So even if it's not, you know, not saying like the IETF should pivot and be a total, totally social a sociologist organization, but you know to have maybe basic um, checkpoints that people can incorporate into their research, such that it always has that contextual framing, um, and then there's more of a standardized way. Because I do, I find that in a lot of like SIGCOM or IMC, it's a lot of ad hoc trying to kind of add context um, based on the researcher's own resources, and so maybe if there's um, a more like again standardized framework for how uh, the technical field can approach field work. Maybe that can there can be more um, that comes from it. 
Uh, so I don't think there's anybody in the queue, so I won't just jump in. Um, I don't think that exists in the in the IETF, but it's also it's not necessary focus of the IETF, but we do have um, also the IRTF, right, the Internet Research Task Force. Um, I'm sharing the group on measurements, so MapRG, and uh, that group has been really just a venue for sharing measurement results at this point. But, you know, if people are interested in, in providing guidance work and how to um, do measurements or how to uh, interpret measurements or whatever, I think it would be nice to do it in that group. Arnel, I think you just joined the queue, right? Uh, oh, you, we, we closed the queue? Sorry. No, no, I'm just trying to verify that it wasn't like you, yes. who I think was in previously, and it's you that's new. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that, that's a new one. Yes, in fact, to continue on that, I, I'm wondering, are we leaning to the idea that maybe it's premature for IETF, but there is probably a lot more for IRTF here? Because I, I must say, I have a lot of sympathy for what uh, Michuki has explained on, on how to tell the story. And of course, uh, <laughs> the code that hits a nerve is, of course, the money, right? So. Uh, I find it a very good strategy. Thank you for sharing, uh, uh, Mitsuki. Uh, but yet, are we in a position to uh, to pose the problem and to and to elaborate a story? And I think we are not there yet. And maybe we need a bit a bit further IRTF work before we get anything on on IETF. Uh, just just my naive position here at the moment. So, having, to, uh, having to be proved wrong. Yeah, I, know, I, I would like to reply to that because I, I was one of the people on the IB who uh, initiated uh, initiated this workshop, and my intention was not necessarily solving this problem. Um, you know, ISOC. There are multiple people here from ISOC in, in the workshop um, who was already doing a huge amount of work. There's a lot of work in research and in other communities in civil society, um, but my real intention. With having this as an IB workshop was also to make sure um, there's awareness and people understand the situation, the current um, situation and problems we have when developing protocols that may or may not impact our protocol work. Uh, but my expectation was not that the IETF as, as an organization is able to solve these problems alone, for sure yeah. not. But, but Mira, I think I think the, the, there is one part that is, from my point of view, uh, in IETF, but my point on operational is issues is 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 a real problem and and I see it's it's it, I mean sorry I'm very confused I'm tired after a long day but the um, we have a problem of uh, of one community which is underrepresented now in in IETF so when we do protocols or when we do things we always forget the migration issue always it cost me 17 migrations in my life on 200 million users for something like 15 years in my life. I still have the bullets in my back. It hurts. And it's always easy to go for green feed and I hear people, yes, let's drop email, but you must be kidding me. You are not going to drop email before 50 years. We need to have a whole generation to actually die before you can actually do it. And so you can't go in idealistic mode all the time because each time you go there, you pay the price for the fact that the train goes at the speed of its, of its slowest wagon. You can dream the world to be different, but that's, that's an issue. And I find it, in terms of awareness, yes, I agree with you. But in this case, we have to improve on operational issues. Look at how many times we heard the term, but people don't know how to manage, don't have the best practices, don't know how to migrate, they are not migrating. It's a pain to migrate. And that's where I think we have a, an issue. Let alone security. Um, so, so one of my comments, my, I think my comment is, um, it's just about what we, what, what's hard, what's easy, and then what gets left behind. Because I think one of the, um, from my perspective, one of the major fail points of a uh, forum for standard setting that is in the context of um, you know free market capitalism, right? Is that a lot of what gets implemented, a lot of what gets focused on, 
is really driven by market. So the incentive, yeah. right, is that, you know, this will, uh, there, there, you know, companies have an incentive to do it this way. And what I mean by it is, is maybe both actually to bring in our nose perspective, both designing and developing the principles of the protocol and how the protocol is designed. And then also there's an expectation that it will get impl implemented. And especially the latter is where the IETF believes that the, the market will sort that out, right? We're not protocol police, there's no expectation that you can force that sort of implementation. But I think the real issue with that and what we're talking about with digital divide, but also in general, this whole workshop on barriers to access is that these barriers tend to be, um, they, they exist sometimes because, right, of, of inequalities because of the market, because there's no money to be made. Um, and so they're left behind. And so if we rely on the same logic of, yeah. Um, developing by, uh, you know, market driven, profit driven sensibilities and also then implementation, it's just going to be so difficult. So I was really moved actually mm -hmm. by Sarmad's presentation because you find pay, you know, slide after slide after slide of things that need to be done, you know, boxes that need to be checked by a variety of different agencies, by a variety of different folks to make this actually work. It's overwhelming. It's an amazing amount of work. But that's because it's a hard issue, right? And that, you know, now we have to, um, you know, implement this. It's actually difficult to implement and there's no actual payoff to do it other than like it's the right thing to do and it will serve communities that certainly have very um, shallow pockets, right? Um, it's the same true with, with community networks. Often those community networks exist because the market has not served them with internet access. Uh, so I guess I just want to reflect that I think without a sort of value driven, without sort of principles or values driving this work in the IETF, it won't get done uh, yeah. because there's no incentive for companies to come with this work on their own um, and then to implement the standards that come out of processes that consider barriers to access as a value, not, not just other sort of values. Mallory, may, may I continue? Or? Yeah, I think at this point, it's not a terribly difficult queue to manage, but I will remind everybody we have just only 4 minutes left. So, maybe if there are closing thoughts or people want to reflect, that'd be good. So, if you want to do that, go ahead, Arna. Yeah, I don't want to take the floor if people want to take the floor. So, but, but yeah, I, in fact, here, the issue is a design issue is, is if you want to get protocols that are better at migrations, operational issues, I mean, all of what you described, you simply need to. We create an atmosphere where I'm not saying that we should then force that people should include this from design perspective about that. But I, I wonder if we do have the right design methodologies that are leading to this situation. I, I just wonder, I, I'm not strong enough to understand if we have included them in the past or maybe in the past we did it randomly. Maybe sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And maybe we should reflect on. What's the methodology of the designer here? And, and, and of course, we will lead to a lot of conflicts and trade offs because if you, the more you include characteristics you want as an outcome, the more you are going to have to do trade offs. And that's good because this is forcing us to have a real thinking about how we aggregate and how we optimize this aggregation on the design. That's one thought. The other thought is about the, the issues that. Right now, from Ralph's presentation, when I when it reminded me about the socio sociological issue about um, uh, the fact that we have sometimes situations that help for centralization and or help for certain constituencies to be better served than others. I wonder if this is a DNRG story here to that DNRG should take on this issue. Perhaps I'm trying to bucket the. To, sp to break the problems we are facing into buckets and try to see where those buckets could go. That's that's all what I'm trying to do. Great. Other closing thoughts from folks. We will have one more day tomorrow. Uh, we're hoping all of you come back for those presentations and that discussion. If you have anything in the meantime, also feel free to share links 
or thoughts on the email list that everyone should be subscribed to at this point? Maybe can I make one more high level comment? I think we, yes, um, we should not forget that inequalities is not only because of digital, right? I mean, these inequalities is, exist in the world and the internet can make those inequalities worse or can help to make it better. And I think we need to really focus on, on the second part, right? To really use the internet as a tool in order to uh, improve the situation in the world. Just like as a very high level thought to potentially start on, on a positive uh, end and on a positive note here. Fair enough. No, that's good. I do appreciate that. Um, all right, well, we'll end, you know, less than a minute um, early. And just really want to thank everybody for your engagement on this issue and especially to the presenters who had some really excellent research um, and just excellent talks. So thanks very much and see you tomorrow. Bye everyone.